So I don't know what you did for Independence Day. I participated in one of the smallest parades ever in my neighborhood. It was awesome. It was a lot of fun. Uh, but Independence Day is great, right? We, we have this whole weekend where we celebrate freedom. We celebrate the birthday of America. And part of that birthday, like I said, is freedom. We talk about freedom and the freedoms that we have and the freedoms that we get to enjoy. And I think as Christians, we actually get to enjoy this in a little bit more of a spiritual way than people of other faiths. And the reason why is because freedom in Christ is something that is core to the, the values and core to our understanding of the gospel. We get this thing called freedom of Christ. It's not mentioned once or twice. It's mentioned regularly in Scripture, particularly in Romans. As we go on this Romans road trip, we've kind of hit Fourth of July weekend. And so rather than having a cookout, we're going to camp out in Romans 6 and 7. We're going to skip some, some sections. It's quite long. But we're going to talk in Romans 6 and 7 about the freedom that we enjoy in Christ, the freedom that we get to celebrate. Now, I don't know about you, but I sometimes don't feel free in Christ. Sometimes I feel really burdened by sin that I commit, and I feel like I'm almost enslaved to it. Like, I did it yesterday, I'm going to do it again tomorrow. It's going to happen. Other times I feel enslaved to obligation. I feel like, ah, I need to do a better job of, of following what God wants me to do. I need to do a better job of praying and to be better about reading God's Word. And there's this sense of, of enslavement, and that's not freedom in Christ. I don't know where you're at today, but that's, that's where I'm at, and that's kind of where I wound up reading through this passage. So today we're going to talk about how we can enjoy our freedom in Christ. Like I said, we're in Romans 6 and 7, and, and this passage, we're going to break it down by looking at one fact or one indicative, and then we're going to look at three imperatives or three commands that we get from God today. So the first fact, the only fact we're going to talk about today is that you have been declared Free. You've been declared free. Look at verse 1 of chapter 6. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. Paul is continuing this hypothetical argument with a hypothetical opponent. opponent and as Paul makes assertions, he's anticipating uh, rebuttals from this opponent that doesn't really exist. And so what he's responding to is uh, chapter 5. He says, where sin increased, Grace increased all the more, and he's actually anticipating somebody coming back and saying, well, if grace increases when I sin, then let's get to sinning. Let's, let's lust, let's look at all the porn we can, because grace is going to increase. I'm going to yell and cuss and swear and berate people constantly, because grace will increase. I'm going to judge people, because grace will increase. And Paul's response is, the strongest negative possible, by no means. In Greek, it's meganoita. By no means. Absolutely not. And there's a fundamental reason why we don't do this. Sin doesn't rule over us anymore. Sin's not our boss. He's not in charge. And Romans does this cool thing of personifying sin. Sin's like this, this it's, not real. it's not like a person, it's real, but it's not a person. But Paul personifies him, makes him this tyrant, makes him this ruler that's brutal to serve and cruel, this cruel master. And that's how we're going to look at him today, this, this tyrant that we're, 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 we've been declared free from. So what happened? How did we get free from the tyrant? Well, we died. We died. Verse 2, again, by no means, how can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who've been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. It's where we get the, when we baptize people, we raise them up and say, raised to walk in newness of life. That's where it comes from. Paul's saying that, that Christ died. And when Christ died, sin no longer ruled over him. So guess what? Sin no longer rules over us. We'll talk about that a little bit more. You were declared dead with Christ. Now, he says baptism here. I want to make this real clear. Baptism doesn't save you. Okay, do you hear me? Baptism doesn't save you. Baptism, however, is a culmination of what's called the ordo de salutis. It's, ordo salutis. It's, it's the culmination, it's the physical expression of what God has done in your heart. So the unbaptized believer, it doesn't mean you're not saved, it's not mean you're complete, you're, it doesn't mean you're not completely saved. It means that... That's the physical way, that's the way the church for 2,000 years has expressed that they are now united with Christ. If you want to know more about baptism, guess what? Wednesday, we're doing Doctrine and Dessert right there in the commons. You can come and join us, shameless plug. You can ask me all the questions you want about baptism. You say, Travis, did you say this? No, I didn't. Even if I did say it, no, I didn't. 
What goes down to the grave, united to sin, ruled over by sin, comes up, resurrected to walk in newness of life. And the, and, and the reason why, as Baptists, we do immersion is because it pictures that perfectly. Going down into the water, coming back up. That's why we do it that way, right? And when you come back up, you have a new ruler. You have someone new in charge of you. What raised comes back up to someone who's been declared free, free from the penalty of sin, so no longer subject to God's wrath. That's justification. And then you're also free from the power of sin. Sin no longer controls you, manipulates you, makes you do things that you don't want to do. That's called sanctification. And progressively over time, as you grow in Christ, as you walk with him, sin has less and less of a hold on your life. It's called progressive sanctification. So if we put our faith in Christ, if we've been redeemed by his blood, we're no longer enslaved to the old way of doing things. No longer enslaved. Don't have to worry about that anymore. Look at verse 5. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we'll certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin, that is the body that's manipulated, that's controlled by sin, the body of sin would be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. So on the 4th of July, we celebrate what? What's the point of the 4th of July? What a historical event do we remember? Declaration of Independence, right? Which was actually composed on the 2nd, not signed until August, but whatever, you know. <laughs> semantics. We picked the 4th. So... When, when the founding fathers, the guys that wrote, signed the Declaration of Independence, go into Independence Hall in Philadelphia, the United States is still a British colony. There's 13 colonies. It's not the United States. They still take, pay taxes. They still rule, are ruled over by King George III. And then a couple hours later, when they come back out that afternoon, when they emerge, after they've buried themselves in Independence Hall, when they emerge, they've declared themselves to be a new nation, and they don't do any of those things anymore. Now, what's really cool about our Declaration of Independence from sin is that we don't make that declaration. Remember, in, did you ever see The Office where Michael Scott declares bankruptcy? <laughs> Clearly you have. He walks out of his office and he says, I declare bankruptcy! And he thinks that that's how he declares bankruptcy, because he declared it. If we were to declare ourselves free from sin without trusting in Christ... That would be the equivalent of Michael Scott's declaration from sin, or from bankruptcy. It has no power, it has no binding. But because God declares it over us in Christ, we are now free. We are a new nation. We are part of a new kingdom, a new realm. We are joined to Christ, united with him through faith, and we are justified. And so it unites us with him. This is the indicative, right? This is the fact of our life. Now it, the, the, the problem becomes working this out, and that brings us to our three commands, our three imperatives. And the first command is, what are we free to do? We are free to fight. We are free to fight. Look at verse 11. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Jesus Christ. This is the first imperative that we're looking at. We've been set free from sin, and so we have something to do. We consider ourselves dead to sin. And the reason why we do this is because Jesus is now dead to sin. Now, what does that mean, dead to sin? Does that mean that Jesus sinned? No, it does not. Jesus, when he puts on flesh, when he become, well, when the Son of God uh, incarnates and dwells among us, 100% God, 100% man, he subjects himself to living in a world full of sin, which means he's faced with temptation. He's also faced with sin, death, evil. He has to deal with sick people, dying people all the time. But after his resurrection and his ascension, guess what? He's no longer subject to temptation. Now, I don't believe that Jesus could sin. We can talk about that some other time. But he's no longer subject to those things. And so in our case, because we've been raised with him, we should consider ourselves also dead to sin. Now, the fact of the matter is we can be tempted as Christians, and we will, in fact, fall. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But we need to start thinking differently. You need to start getting on a war footing with your sin. John Owen says, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. It's one of my favorite quotations. You need to start considering yourself dead to sin, at war with sin, not at peace with the things in your life. This is, you need to recognize that, that there's things in your life that are better than what you used to do. Jesus Christ is better than sin. And I don't mean it seem like that at the time when you're tempted. Man, trust me, when I'm tempted, I'm like, that is, that's exactly what I want. 
But I have to remind myself, nope, Jesus is better. The gospel is better than that. Whatever that promises will be short-lived. Whatever the gospel promises for me is going to be long and forever enjoyed. Jesus is better. And you remind yourself. You preach the gospel to yourself. You have to actually remember, I don't belong to that anymore. I used to do that, and maybe you're a believer and you still do it, and you're like, no, 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 that's not what I do anymore. I do this now. I'm a Christian. I do this now. You have to preach yourself the gospel over and over again. Jesus' way of forgiveness, his grace, his mercy is better than clapping back at somebody when they get smart with you. You don't always have to have the last word because Jesus' way is better. I'm a part of a new kingdom with a new king. So I have to focus my attention on all times on this new reality, especially during temptation. You have to get in this mindset and it's a changed mindset. You have to train yourself this way. And at first it's going to seem awkward. When you're faced with this temptation, you're like, man, Jesus is better. It's going to sound weak coming out of your mouth. It's going to sound strange. It's going to sound wooden. It's going to sound forced. But you get in the habit of saying it. And saying it over and over again. Saying, no, Jesus Christ is crucified, buried, and resurrected for me, and I'm going this way instead. And even if the temptation says, oh, well, you'll, you'll, you'll be back tomorrow. Well, maybe I will be, but not today. I'm going over here. Have you ever tried to teach yourself to write with your non-dominant den- dominant hand? Denominant. Dominant hand. It's awkward, right? When you first start, like I'm right-handed, so left-handed. I see left-handed people write like this. I don't understand why. You don't have to tell me. I just don't. So like, it's really awkward at first. You have to train yourself. You've got to move. Uh, and then uh, eventually, though, as you work on it, your handwriting becomes legible. And somebody might not even be able to tell which hand is right and which one is left, right? In the same way, as we're faced with temptation and we fight against it, we get in this mindset of that, that we are considered dead now to sin. It's going to feel strange at first. But you train yourself again and again and again. And eventually, it'll be your response. Nope, 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 Jesus is better. Nope, Jesus is better. Nope, Jesus is better. And then you begin to couple that with scripture and verses that you memorize. And it develops some weight and some strength. But it doesn't just stop with mental action. We don't just stop there. Look at verse 12. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that is the flesh, to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin, that's your body parts, as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. Paul calls uh, your body parts faculties. So the battle between the old realm and the new realm between sin and unrighteousness and righteousness and following Christ happens in the flesh. It happens in a fleshly body. What goes on in my mind, what goes on in my heart, what goes on in my limbs, what I do with my eyes, my ears, my mouth, what I do with those things, guess what? That's either pursuing sin or pursuing righteousness. And Paul basically says they're either serving sin or they're serving the Lord. And he describes them as members or or instruments. Given that it's the 4th of July weekend, I like to talk about them as weapons. These are weapons, my arms, my mouth, weapons for unrighteousness or weapons for righteousness. And I can either bring them to bear and bring death and destruction everywhere I go by pursuing sin, or I can use them as weapons to give life and flourishing to the people around me by pursuing Christ and giving glory to God through what the weapons that I have, the weapons that God has given me. And he says, don't present yourself, right? He he says it in verse 13. Look back at verse 13. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God. When I was in the the army, we we had a command, a drill command, present arms, right? And if you had a weapon, you you, you did something with it. I never had a weapon. I was a chaplain, so I was a non-combatant. And or, you know, you saluted, right? It was a weak salute, sorry. And, and, and the act of saluting is an act of deference. It's an act of homage. It's an act of honor. It's almost saying, hey, this weapon that I have or my body that I have is in service to the thing that I'm saluting, right? It's why they salute the flag and things like that, right? Saluting a superior officer. Paul's saying, hey, don't, don't offer these things that God has given you. Don't offer your weapons to Satan. Don't offer your weapons to sin. That would be serving the old realm. That's Benedict Arnold. That's betraying your new country. Your new country, offer your weapons to them. Offer your weapons to Christ. So what kingdom are you going to fight for? You're going to fight for your old master? You're going to fight for your new one? God in Christ has empowered us. And what we've done is really kind of cool. We've stolen the weapons that sin was using before. 
to bring death and destruction. Now we've stolen them and we've brought them into the kingdom of God by putting our faith in Christ. And now they can be used to give life. So when the revolution was going on, uh, I don't know if you know military tactics at the time, but people just lined up in a row and shot at each other, which was there was a reason for it. Basically, they couldn't control where the musket ball went, but it still seems really dumb. Um, but that's what they were doing. And then off to the side, they would have the cannon, right? And behind the lines, well, if the infantry broke and ran away, and the, the, the winning army would run up and capture the guns, and they would turn the guns around and actually fire uh, an army's own weapons against them. And there's this great place, if you've ever been to West Point, there's this great place called Trophy Point at West Point. And pretty much every ca- cannon that the United States has captured until like the Mexican-American War is on this like overlook of the Hudson River. And there's a lot of cannons up there. It's pretty cool. You have captured the guns of your enemy. Christ has captured the guns in your enemy is probably a better way to put it. But he's given them to you to wield and to, to wield against sin, death, and evil. Let fly. Let it rip. Use your body to fight against sin, death, and evil and to pursue righteousness and be absolutely lethal with it against sin, death, and evil and bring life. Bring life. It's important that you embrace the freedom that you have to fight and no longer use your mind, your body, your words to bring death and destruction. On July 4th, right, they declare independence uh, and, and everybody kind of is like, okay, cool, we're free. Well, what now? Well, there's a whole bunch of British troops that are still in the colonies, right? So even though they're declared independent, they don't actually look independent, right? So what do they do? They start a revolution. You have Lexington, you have Concord, you have a bunch of other battles, right? Culminating in Yorktown to try and get rid of the occupying army. That is what is the option, opportunity that you have to use your body to kick out the occupying army of sin. Sin still, sin still wants to control you. He has no right to, but he still wants to control you. You can fight against him, choosing different words to say, choosing different thoughts, choosing different actions. You don't have to go down those roads anymore. So when you're tempted to lash out at a friend or a spouse, you choose not to do that. You seek reconciliation instead. When we're tempted to lust and use our, our eyes and our, and our body in sexual gratification, you don't have to do that. You don't have to go down that path. But instead, you can trust God, in patience, and waiting for him to resolve those issues in your life. When you're tempted to meditate, reflect, or embrace arrogant thinking, judgmental thinking, you can choose instead to pray that God would show you how this other person looks in his eyes. And you choose not to be so judgmental. So we're free to fight. We're also free to follow. We are free to follow. Verse 15. What then? I love that. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? So the the, the hypothetical person comes back and says, so if we're not under law, but under grace, does that mean I can just do what I want? Have I been set free to license? Can I just do whatever I want now? And that's honoring to God. And Paul says again, absolutely not. That's not correct at all. Paul, and, and, and I think God, obviously, because it's from uh, the Bible, God has a binary view of humanity. You are either fighting on the side of sin because you are not in Christ, or you have been united with Christ in faith and you were on the side of God. There's no Switzerland in this conflict, okay? You can have chocolate all you want, you can drink your Swiss Miss, you can even get a cool knife, but you are not Switzerland, you are not neutral, right? You are on one side or the other. It is a global conflict, and there are only two sides. And Paul's saying, you've got to choose one or the other. You've got to choose one or the other. And really, the delineation between the two is, where is your faith? Is it in Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection? Or is it your own works, your own efforts, trying to obey the law, trying to keep uh, the law that is impossible to keep? So it's kind of like being in the American colonies in 1783. That was when we actually gained our independence, by the way. It was the end of the war, 1783. And if you're a, a person living in, say, South Carolina or Virginia or New York, you then had a choice. You're like, okay, I can either stay here in America and be an American citizen and follow these new rules that these new Americans have, or I can pack up my family and go back to Great Britain and I can still serve the king, or you can just make a short trip north to Canada. Canada at that point was owned by British as well. But you couldn't stay in the United States and be like, all right, well, we're not, uh, we're not occupied by the British anymore. I guess I'll just open up my own like, sovereign state here that's just my farm. 
and my country will be like my, my three family members. This would be great. You can't do that, right? You had to join one side or the other. And that's what Paul is talking about here. You've got to be a part of one side or the other. You don't have autonomy. Freedom is not autonomy. Sin wants you to think that pursuing autonomy, pursuing whatever you want, is actual freedom. That's a lie. That's a lie. And instead of continuing to abide by these lies and follow that way of life, you can actually follow truth, which is what he talks about in verse 17, a new way of life. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, you've become slaves of righteousness. It's really cool what he talks about here. You have been committed to a way of teaching. You have been given over to a way of teaching. I think when we think of the teachings of the church, doctrine, theology, what Scripture teaches, we think it's our responsibility to hand down this to the next generation, the next generation, and the next. And there's some truth there. But what Paul's talking about here is you have actually been given over to the teaching that comes before you. The teachings of the church, the teachings of the scriptures now instruct you and rule over you. Not the other way around. We don't rule over scripture. Scripture instead rules over us. That's why we have to submit to what scripture says. And he actually says in verse 17, obedient from the heart. So no longer doing it just because we have to. We're doing it because we want to. We desire to follow after God. So we have to submit ourselves to what Scripture says, even if it doesn't make sense. And trust me, I've been to five years of seminary, I do this for a living, and there are parts of Scripture I don't understand. We're in Jeremiah, and they were just talking about, uh, Jeremiah was talking about like, the judgment on Moab and listing off a whole bunch of places, and I was like, I don't know. That could be like, I don't know, Houston for all like, I, I don't know where this is. I don't know everything in Scripture, and I'm not going to know everything. It's a massive book, right? There are some things that don't make sense. That's why you get good commentaries. That's why you talk about it with other people. Some things don't make sense, but we still submit ourselves to it. It might create sticky conversations with your friends. Good. Have the sticky conversation. You have sticky conversations about other things. They're an Eagles fan. You're a Cowboys fan. You don't care about that. Engage with them about things that they believe and that you believe. Don't abandon what Scripture teaches. Maybe it means you don't go to an activity, you don't watch a certain show, you don't do a certain thing because of what Scripture says. We're all followers of Jesus Christ. This is really important, because I don't want to make a church full of biblicists who worship the Bible. That's idolatry. We are all followers of Jesus Christ. However, Scripture is the, is the book, it's the, the, the Word of God, it's the revelation of God that tells us who Jesus is, what He did, and what He desires of us as His followers. And so that's why it's important for us to know Scripture, to engage ourselves with Scripture, to spend time with it. Now, this doesn't mean you don't wrestle with it. Of course you wrestle with it. Ask questions of it. I love questions. I ask questions myself. doesn't mean you don't seek in different interpretations. You do, absolutely do. In fact, we're going to talk about Romans 7 here in a little bit. And the, the commentary that I was using for this sermon, I didn't agree with what the guy said about Romans 7. I thought it was too complicated. I was like, this doesn't make sense to me. I don't know where you're getting this from. So I set him aside and I found another commentary. And I wasn't just looking for something that I agreed with. I was looking for something that I felt like went in line with the text. Seek out different interpretations. Listen to what other people have to say about it. Seek out those other interpretations, right? And then go to Scripture with an attitude of being corrected. If every time you go to Scripture, it just affirms what you think and believe, I don't really think you're letting Scripture read you. I think you're just looking for a warm fuzzy and you're finding a verse that give. Scripture should give me warm fuzzy sometimes. Sometimes I should feel encouraged by scriptures. Sometimes I should feel like, man, I, I got to do some work. Like I'm struggling. Scripture should convict me and challenge me, especially if you're a follower of Christ. The Holy Spirit, part of his job is conviction. We'll talk about that next week. I have to let scripture con correct me. And so maybe one of the things that this looks like for you is getting baptized or joining the church. And you're like, whoa, Travis, that's a big leap. What in the world? Where'd you get that? Well, Scripture says in Matthew 28, 19, that we're supposed to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. If you haven't been baptized, you're disobedient. You're not doing what God has called you to do. That's what Scripture teaches. I don't mean like you're waiting on your baptism day or like you want to do the outdoor baptism. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about like you're putting it off for like months or years. That's disobedience. Joining the church. Now, I understand church membership is a, is a relatively novel concept within the 2,000-year history of the church. I get it. And you're like, well, I'm a part of the church. I go here. That's great. 
But joining the church is the way that our church especially has kind of said, this is how you show you're really committed to this body of believers. You come and you, you, you let us know you want to be a member of the church. And then that opens up opportunities for you to be involved in leadership, to be involved as a deacon potentially. You could be depriving your church of great service because you're like, eh, I don't see the point in joining the church. So you should join. Because Scripture tells you that you need to be involved and committed to a body of believers. And this body of believers had said, this is the way we show that we're committed. We say we want to be members. So one of the problems that the uh, early U.S. government had was the Articles of Confederation. Basically, the Articles of Confederation were a weak constitution that didn't give the federal government enough power to control the states. So they replaced it with what? The Constitution, right? And the Constitution is the supreme document over all the land. The Bible works in a similar way for us. You should look at your life as governed by the Bible, as if it was a, your Constitution, you decide things are biblical or unbiblical. Sometimes things are abiblical. You're like, I don't really know if this is right or wrong. You pray about it. You seek out God's wisdom. You seek out the wisdom of other people. But learn what Scripture says. Read it. Study. Follow it. Trust it more than anything. Trust it to tell you about God. Trust it to tell you about yourself. And if you trust anything more, whether it's an actor, an actress, a politician, a theologian, a writer, let them speak into your life. That's fine. But submit what they say to Scripture, not the other way around. Because you're free to follow, yes, you've been set free to follow Christ, but not to follow him any way that you want. We follow him the way that he has told us he wants. So we've been declared free to fight, been declared free to follow, and we've been declared free to fail. We've been declared free to fail. Look at chapter 7, verse 13. I'm skipping quite a bunch uh, because we don't want to be here till 3. Um, but this passage uh, is really a defense of the Mosaic Law. The guys come back and said, well, what's the point of the Mosaic Law? Is the law bad? Because if, if the law was good, it wouldn't have increased all this sin in our life. We'd be able to follow it. The law's bad. And Paul's like, no, 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 no. The law's good. Look at verse 13. Did that which is good, the law, then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good, the law, in order that sin might be shown to be sin, and through the commandment might be... Uh, Sorry, and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. Verse 14, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. So what Paul's saying here is basically the sin is this, uh, the law is this unwilling uh, uh, accomplice in sins, again, sin personified, sin's mission of destruction and death and drawing all of us away from God. The best way I can relate it to you is imagine a car. It's perfect, it's well-built, runs great, but that actually uh, is used to run over a bunch of people. Now, the car is not the problem, right? The car didn't mean to do that. The, car, the, car, the person behind the wheel is the one who did that. In the same way, the law is used by sin, that way it's been co-opted by sin. And so out of this, Paul kind of just starts to describe this personal struggle. I'm going to read it in its entirety, because if you're like me, this is something that should resonate as familiar with you. Look at verse 15. For I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law, and that is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. Basically means the core of who I am doesn't want to do this, but I still wind up doing it, this part of me that's still controlled by sin. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find that it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my innermost being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Let me break it down to you this way. You go to church, you go to a camp, you go, you go and do something that gets you on this religious high, and you're like, I'm going to change my life. And maybe you do for a couple weeks, a couple months, but then you find yourself right back in the same thing again and again and again. This is the struggle that Paul is talking about here. I want to do so much better than I actually do, but I still wind up falling back in this. And this is what I mean by being free to fail. You are free to fail. God's not going to kick you out of the kingdom because you struggle with sin. God's not going to kick you out of the kingdom because you repeatedly struggle with sin. Now, should we fight sin? Should we wrestle with sin? Yes. Should we be like, well, that that's just happens. It's not a big deal. No, it's a huge deal. But the guilt that we feel, the, the, the pain that we feel, the pain is good. Guilt is not. 
He has set us free from that guilt. We've been set free to fail. And so we find ourselves struggling with sin, and that's not a bad thing. It's good to struggle with it. Fight it. And Paul, rather than saying, what should I do? He actually says in verse 24, Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. Rather than saying, what should I do? Paul says, who's going to rescue me from this? I, I got no hope. And he says, Jesus Christ the Lord. Jesus Christ is the one who's going to rescue me. At the, during the American Revolution, I don't know if you know this, the American army was not very good. They got their tails kicked up and down the continent by the best army in the world at the time. Until two things happened. One, there was the Battle of Saratoga, which was actually won by Benedict Arnold. Fun fact. Battle of Saratoga. And all of a sudden, the French are like, hey, these guys are legit. They might actually win this thing. Let's pile on to the British. And they do, along with the Spanish and some other countries. So reinforcements arrive. And then you remember the, the winter of Valley Forge. Everybody remembers it because of that one painting of, of George Washington, like Tebowing in the middle of, of, the, of the winter snow, right? And we remember that it's really cold, but you don't know what actually happens in that winter. German officers actually come over and begin to train the militia to actually be good at shooting things, which is important for combat. And they come out of the winter in Valley Forge, and they're actually a good army. And the British are like, what? I don't know where you are in your life. Maybe you've been on a losing streak with sin, and you're just like, man, I'm awful. I keep failing. Guess what? Your Saratoga might be coming. You might have a victory coming that changes the whole color of the war. Reinforcements might be on the way from brothers and sisters in Christ, from the Holy Spirit strengthening you and encouraging you. Don't give up. Keep fighting. Maybe it seems like God's not walking with you. Maybe it seems like you're really cold where you're at and just alone. Take that time to train like they did at Valley Forge. Take that time to learn your craft. Learn how to use Scripture. Memorize it. Grow in it. Follow Him. Because springtime's coming, and guess what happens in the spring? That's when armies go to war. And then you go back to the fight. You've been set free. You've been declared righteous. So don't live in slavery anymore. Not slavery to sin. You've been set free to fight, so fight. Use your weapons to build life and to follow Christ. You've been set free to follow. Know what God desires of you and do it. You've often been set free to fail. When you screw up, when you mess up, turn to the Father. I'm with Jesus. He loves me, and, he, and I trust him, and I'm going to keep going. And that's how we celebrate our independence as followers in Christ. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, you've poured hope into our hearts because we have been set free and we rejoice in the fact that we've been set free. Not to just go out on our own and do our own thing and do whatever it is, because that would be death in and of itself. I don't know what's best for me, but you know what's best for me, Father. And so, Lord God, I pray that, that every day, every person in this room would celebrate their freedom in Christ by fighting, by following you, and when they fail, by turning to you and asking for help and dependence in you. We love you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.